All right. Maybe we'll give people one more minute. Um, but welcome to the UCLA Planetarium show for tonight. And so at any point, feel free to ask questions in the chat, and I'll, uh, you know, try to take a look at them from time to time. All right, I think it's about time that we get started. Um, so welcome to the UCLA Planetarium Show. Uh, and today uh, I'm going to be talking about super-Earths, uh, the uh, weird and wild worlds of the galaxy. Um, these planets, I'm going to talk about these planets that we found that are unlike anything uh, that we've ever seen in our solar system. Uh, and uh, these planets can tell us a lot about uh, not only what's out there, but uh, how our own solar system formed, and about uh, what the prospects are for finding anyone else out in the cosmos. Uh, and so to introduce myself, I'm Will Meisner. Uh, I'm a PhD student at UCLA, uh, but I'm a little bit of an interloper here. I'm not from the astronomy department, I'm actually in the Earth, Planetary, and Space Sciences department. And so uh, but I'm very happy to be here and to tell you guys about um, super-Earths, which is um, very related to what I uh, work on in my research, and so I'm happy to answer any questions about that. Um, but, um, so to get started and to introduce super-Earths, I want to start with something a little closer to home, and I want to start with um, the planets of our own solar system, because our solar system is really what gives us a reference for um, all these other systems that might be out there. Um, and it basically kind of frames our point of view um, because these are the planets we know the best and these are the planets we get to examine up close. Um, and these are the planets uh, that really, as you'll see, provide a big reference for how we look at the planets outside of our own solar system. So these are the planets that go around the sun. Um, the, their sizes are to scale, but their distances, their separations are not. So they're not really this close together, but this is how big they are compared to each other. Um, and you can see that there's a pretty stark division in our solar system between big planets uh, like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune that are further out, um, and small planets like Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars that are closer in. Uh, and so these make up our eight planets. Um, and there are various kind of dwarf planets, um, things like Ceres in the asteroid belt, and Pluto and some of its companions out beyond Neptune in the Kuiper belt. Um, and of course, Pluto was famously demoted a few years ago now. Um, um, but that's because we started finding so many of its friends um, that we thought it was more like them than like normal planets. Um, but let's talk a little bit about what makes the inner solar system different from the outer solar system. So the inner solar system, and again, these are all to scale, um, but just kind of shown as marbles, um, is full of worlds that are relatively small, 
Uh, they're mostly made of rock and metal. Um, so earth has a thin covering of water, but really uh, it's mostly made of rock, especially on the inside, uh, and metal. And so are Mars, Mercury, and Venus. And um, despite all being kind of roughly similar in size, they're very different in terms of how they are on their surfaces. Earth, as we know, uh, is very nice and lovely, um, great to live on. Um, Venus um, has an atmosphere a hundred times thicker than Earth. It's like a thousand degrees Celsius at its surface, and it's very unpleasant uh, to be. We've sent, uh, I think, one spacecraft to the surface of Venus, and it was crushed within hours. Um, uh, Mars, we've sent lots of spacecraft to. We have rovers there right now. Um, but uh, Mars is pretty inhospitable. It's cold. Um, it's uh, pretty lifeless, pretty barren. Um, and uh, Mercury, the smallest of the inner planets, uh, is even more uh, kind of extreme. Um, it's extremely hot, um, very unpleasant to be on. Um, but these are all our rocky companions in the solar system. And even in the solar system, there's lots of variety. And that kind of becomes a theme when it comes to exoplanets. Um, meanwhile, the outer solar system is full of large, cold, gaseous planets. So the biggest one is Jupiter, um, which you know has all these um, very intricate uh, gas dynamics. And see, these are all gas giants. They don't have solid surfaces. Uh, instead, they're just um, big balls of gas and um, with maybe some rock very deep inside, but not anything like uh, how uh, the inner solar system is. And so you can see to scale that these are much bigger than Earth, Jupiter. Um, you could fit about 11 Earths across it and about 1,000 Earths inside of its volume, so it's a completely different scale. Um, Saturn, you know, a little bit smaller than Jupiter, and then Uranus and Neptune we call the ice giants because they're very rich in water, but they're very, very cold. Um, and so, again, these are very different uh, bodies than Earth and Venus are. So, um, but don't let this fool you. Jupiter may seem big compared to Earth, but it's dwarfed by the Sun. The Sun's really the head honcho in all of this. Um, the real king of the solar system, it dictates kind of how everything rotates, um, and it really kind of bosses the rest of the solar system around. Um, and so, right now, the, so those are the planets in our own solar system, but what is an exoplanet? What is a planet outside of our solar system? Well, um, exoplanets are planets that go around other stars. So uh, all the planets in the solar system go around the sun. Um, but it turns out there are planets that go around other stars instead of the sun. Um, and the first one, so this is a histogram showing... Um, the cumulative number, so the amount of exoplanets in total that we know uh, every year. So if you went back to 2013, we knew of about 1,000. Uh, and so the first exoplanets were discovered about 30 years ago. Um, but now there's over 4,000 exoplanets known. Um, and you might notice that this has a couple big spikes in it, which might seem kind of weird. So. Um, these spikes are due to discoveries of the Kepler Space Telescope. And so this was a very exciting um, uh, mission that was launched by NASA. And it's, what it did was it stared into the sky and looked for exoplanets. Um, so it stared at one patch of sky for a really long time. And it looked and looked at all the stars that were out there. And it tried to find planets around those stars. Um, and these two big jumps in how many exoplanets we knew correspond to um, big data releases by the team running Kepler Space Telescope. Um, and how does Kepler find all these planets? Well, it finds them using the transit method. Um, so we can't actually see these planets like we can see um, our companions like Jupiter and Venus in the sky um, because they're much too dim compared to their stars. So um, the, just like how we can't see the planets in the sky when the sun is out because the sun is too bright, we can't see these planets near their suns because their suns are way too bright. They kind of wash out any light the planet is giving off. Um, but instead what we can see is we can see the shadows 
of these planets passing in front of their stars, as kind of shown by this animation. Um, and what these planets, um, when these planets go in front of their stars, they block some of the star's light. Um, they end up, um, and so you can see that in this graph down here. So with time, as the planet um, goes in front of the star, the amount of brightness that the star is giving off uh, at least from our perspective, goes down a little bit, and then it comes back up after the planet passes by. Um, and this gives us some information about the planet. It tells us kind of how big the planet is, and it tells us, uh, it turns out, uh, how long it takes the planet to go in front of the star, because we can just wait until the next time the planet goes in front. Um, and so um, this is how we find exoplanets. It's how we, um, oops, sorry. It's how we um, think about, uh, and it's how we, yeah, it's how we discover most of the exoplanets that we know about today. Um, and so, what have we found, right? We know about the eight planets in our solar system, but are other planet, are other solar systems like our solar system, or are they different? That was a big question when the Kepler Space Telescope was launched. Um, and what we found is that there's a huge variety of exoplanets. Um, there are lots of different kinds of planets, unlike anything in our solar system. Um, and the way that these systems are constructed um, also turns out to be way different than um, our solar system. So uh, one thing that was really surprising to a lot of people is that there are lots and lots of planets out there that are much closer to their stars than Mercury is to the Sun, um, which is uh, kind of... Uh, incredible and surprising, and it means that these planets are really different than the planets in our solar system. Um, that they must be, for one thing, much hotter because they're so close to their suns for the most part. Um, and so, right, this is just kind of a general picture of what we found. Um, and remember, if you recall back to, you know, how our solar system is set up, it turns out these systems are set up really differently uh, than how, how our solar system is. And this is just an illustration. Um, of different systems. Uh, let's see. Do you want to see? Oh, in the chat, someone asked, how big is Pluto compared to Mercury? That's a good question. Uh, ooh, I don't know if I know this off the top of my head. I think Pluto is a little bit smaller, um, but Pluto uh, was, if you're asking that, if you're wondering why Pluto was demoted, it's because Pluto, uh, it turns out, has a lot of other things nearby it. So Mercury is kind of the head honcho of its own little area, um, and Pluto still has a lot of other kind of asteroids nearby it, and so people don't think that it has kind of cleared its area enough to be dominant enough to be a planet. Um, but I think they're not that different in size, but I think Mercury is a bit bigger, but I'd have to double check. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit right, about why we care. Why, we, why do we care that lots of planets are completely unlike our solar system? Well, um, it's because, for one thing, if we look at all these other systems, we can learn more about how our own solar system came to be. We can learn about if kind of the processes that made our solar system set up the way it is are unique, or if they're more universal. Um, and, you know, trying to determine if we're special or not has bearing kind of, you know, besides being important to our self-esteem, um, it has a lot of importance for understanding if there's anyone else out there. Um, if planets like the Earth are easy to form, then, you know, maybe it's easy um, for life to evolve in other places too. But if the processes that made our planet are really unique and special, then maybe it's harder. Um, and maybe there aren't any other, you know, Marvin the Martian types um, looking at us while we're trying to look for them. Um, and so that's why studying exoplanets really tells us a lot more about uh, our odds for finding anyone else out there. So uh, how do we categorize exoplanets? Well, scientists, you know, like to reference things that they're already familiar with. And so uh, we usually categorize exoplanets as um, kind of by comparing them to uh, bodies that already exist in our solar system, things we're familiar with. So um, we can start from biggest to smallest, right? So we see lots of exoplanets that we call gas giants. So they're somewhere kind of close to the size of Saturn or Jupiter. 
Um, but they can also be much larger. That was one surprise of exoplanets. Um, that we find these hot, these Jupiter-like planets that are even bigger than Jupiter, which we didn't expect. Um, and they're really hot. So they're very close to their stars. So plants that are close to their stars we call hot. And plants that are far from their stars we call cold. Um, and so that tells us about whether or not... Um, and so, yeah, again, these are kind of basic categorizations that we use. Um, and so the next class below gas giants, just because it's the next class in our own solar system, are these Neptune-like planets. Um, and so we think that they're kind of similar in size to our own Neptune and Uranus. Um, and they probably, like Neptune and Uranus, are gas planets. So they have gas uh, hydrogen-dominated atmospheres. Um, but some of them are actually smaller than Neptune. Um, and so we call these sub-Neptunes or mini-Neptunes. Um, and we just call them that because they're smaller than Neptune, but they're still bigger than Earth. And, you know, we've never really been quite sure what these planets are like. Um, because they might not be icy like Neptune, especially if they're hot. Uh, if they're close to their stars, maybe they don't have as much ice. Um, and then the next one down, or what I'm going to be talking about in this talk, right, we have our super-Earths. Um, and we just call them that because they're bigger than Earth. And so we don't have anything in between the size of Earth and Neptune or in our own solar system. Um, but maybe the super-Earths uh, are some sort of in-between planet, and we're not really sure exactly what they're like. Uh, and then finally, there are these terrestrial planets. We haven't seen many of those yet, um, but we presume that they're probably a lot like Earth. Um, maybe at least they're rocky, but maybe they're like Venus, too. Venus is also a terrestrial planet, and so it's not really clear exactly uh, what's going on, even if we find planets that are kind of similar in size to Earth. And so, uh, so what are super-Earths like? Um, again, all a super-Earth really is, uh, is that it's bigger than Earth, but smaller than Neptune. So it could be hotter than Earth, it could be colder, um, you know, it could be made of the same things that Earth is. Maybe it's mostly made of rock, maybe in a metal, but maybe it's not. Maybe these are water worlds, or maybe they're, you know, something even more weird. Um, just calling it a super-Earth doesn't necessarily mean it's very much like Earth at all. Um, and, you know, what are the atmospheres of these planets like? Um, maybe it's Earth-like, but it could be thick. It could have a Venus-like atmosphere. Um, or they could have no atmosphere at all. Um, like Mars does. Mars has almost no atmosphere. Um, and so just calling a planet a super-Earth doesn't really necessarily mean it's very Earth-like. Uh, it's just a size categorization. Uh, it's kind of our first pass at trying to figure out what these planets are like. Uh, and so one super-Earth that's very different than Earth um, is uh, 55 Cancri E. And so um, this planet is thought to be a lava world. Um, so it's an incredibly hot planet. It's really, really close to its star. Uh, it whips around its star in a matter of days, um, whereas Mercury takes, you know, weeks and weeks to go, uh, a few months to go around. Um, and we think that it, its surface should be hot enough to be just completely molten lava. Um, and some people have even speculated that um, rocks not only should be liquid, but they should be gas at the surface of 55 Cancri E. And so you could get these skies that are full of shimmering kind of rock gas particles. Uh, and so the folks at NASA uh, made this poster uh, of kind of a pretend visitor to this planet, um, taking, you know, a vista of the sparkling skies of 55 Cancri E. Uh, these posters are really great. I think I have some more of them behind me right now. Um, and so you can actually look these up, and they're free to download online if you want them. Um, and they're called the NASA Exoplanet Transit Bureau. Um, and so this is just one artist's conception. I should say, these are all going to be artists' conceptions, right? We don't really have real pictures of these planets because their stars are so bright compared to them. Uh, and so, right, so 55 Cancri E is a super-Earth, but it's definitely not very uh, friendly to, you know, you know, life because, you know, we don't think life can survive on a planet made of lava. Um, and that kind of prompted people to define this habitable zone idea. Um, and the whole idea of the habitable zone, it's sometimes called the Goldilocks zone, um, 
is that it has to be, uh, you want to find planets, uh, if you want to find life, you want to find planets that have the right temperature to have liquid water. Because, you know, we don't know much about what life on other planets might require. But all life on Earth definitely needs liquid water. Um, it's really fundamental to all of our chemistry and everything. And so the first thing we should look for is plants that could have liquid water on their surface. Um, and so they can't be too hot or else all the water would evaporate and you would just have steam. And it can't be too cold or else all the water would freeze and you would just have ice. Uh, and so Venus, right, is too hot. Uh, and Mars is too cold, and so, you know, just like Goldilocks found the porridge that was just right um, and didn't get eaten by hungry space bears like this cartoon, um, you need to find a planet that's kind of the just right temperature. Um, and so, sometimes you'll see in the news, right, that we found a habitable zone planet. And if there's anything you should take away from this talk, habitable zone planet is not the same thing as an inhabited planet. And it's not even the same thing as a planet that humans could go live if we could get there. Um, all habitable zone means is that it's at the right temperature that maybe if conditions were right, you could have liquid water. Um, but we don't know if that's sufficient for life. It probably isn't. And we don't even know if these planets do have liquid water. Um, and so, Again, we wanna, you want to be careful when you see headlines about habitable wor worlds. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean inhabited worlds. Um, and it doesn't even mean worlds that might be nice. Um, and so one such planet that was found uh, in the habitable zone and made quite uh, the news a few years ago was this planet called K218b. It was found with Kepler, um, our friendly space telescope. Uh, and it was announced that they found this planet in the habitable zone, and it had water in its atmosphere. Uh, and so people were understandably excited. Um, but when you took a closer look at this planet, uh, and you took a look at its size and its density, it turns out that this isn't a super-Earth at all. Um, it turns out that this is actually a sub-Neptune. Um, and so this planet is probably gaseous, kind of more like Neptune than Earth. Uh, and so it definitely doesn't have conditions um, that make it hospitable for life, at least as we know it. Um, and so this is another pitfall that even if a planet is in the habitable zone, and even if it seems like it has water in its atmosphere, it doesn't mean it's a habitable planet, because it might not even be a super-Earth, um, or an Earth-like planet. Um, and so, where's the line, right, you might ask? Like, what's the line between... Uh, a sub-Neptune planet, like K218b, or Kepler-22b, uh, and a more rocky world, like 55 Cancri E. Um, well, it turns out, you know, people at first weren't sure that there even was a line. Maybe it just went smoothly from one to the other. Uh, but it turns out that there is actually a difference. Um, and that, uh, so what this histogram shows is size relative to Earth. Uh, so Neptune is about four Earth radii, and K218b is about two and a half. Um, and Earth, of course, is one. Um, and this is like a basically frequency. This is how often we see planets that are this size. Uh, and it turns out that there is a separation between planets that are kind of a bit bigger than Earth and planets that are a bit smaller than Neptune. Um, and this has just been found in the last few years that there's kind of a, there's not very many planets in between. And so what people think is that this is kind of a natural dividing line between super-Earths and sub-Neptunes, and that somehow the formation of these planets must cause this. And I just like to throw this in because this is what I work on all day. I try to think about what sorts of things could separate these sorts of planets um, and how you might sort between one and the other. Okay, uh, but now let's talk about maybe some more interesting planets. So these really are super-Earths in the habitable zone of their stars. Uh, and the most famous example of this is the TRAPPIST-1 system. So TRAPPIST-1 is this very exciting system that we found. Um, it has seven planets that all go in front of its star. Um, they all transit. Um, and so uh, three of the planets, uh, the innermost three, are too hot uh, to have liquid water, and the outer one is too cold, but three of them do fall in this ha Goldilocks habitable zone. Um, uh, but the weird thing about this system that makes it really different from our own is that these planets orbit a really tiny star. Um, 
They orbit a star that's about a tenth the radius of our own sun and gives off about a hundredth of the brightness. Um, so this star is very cold compared to our sun. And so its habitable zone, the, the distance you have to get from it in order to get some nice watery temperatures, uh, is way closer than our own solar system. And so you can see it, you know, to scale the orbital distances compared to our own solar system. They way, way, way inside Mercury, but they orbit such a dim star that it turns out to be about the same temperature. Um, and so people really study these planets very closely um, to try to figure out what's going on in their atmospheres and what they might be like even if they orbit a star that's really different from our own. Um, and so um, I talked a lot about the Kepler Space Telescope, um, which found all sorts of planets for us. Um, but unfortunately, um, Kepler is now out of commission. Um, it ran out of fuel, and part of it broke. Uh, and so it's no longer operating. Um, but NASA luckily launched a new telescope um, that's out there in the sky right now, and it's looking for planets. Um, and it's called TESS, um, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. And so this is a cute little animation that NASA made about Kepler passing the torch of planet discovery onto TESS. And TESS is very excited as it flies off into space as Kepler waves goodbye. Um, and so uh, it turns out it's now TESS that's making all the new discoveries that you read about in the news um, as NASA's kind of main planet discovery satellite. And so uh, one such planet that it's found, uh, another planet kind of in the habitable zone that might be a super Earth, is a planet called TOI 700D. Um, but, you know, even though this planet, right, it checks all our boxes, it's a super Earth, it's in the habitable zone, um, but even this planet is probably really different than our own Earth. Um, and that's because um, one side of this planet um, always faces, the same side of this planet always faces its star. And so this planet has one permanent day side and one permanent night side. Um, and so if you lived on this planet, right, somehow you could be on this side and it would always be the middle of the day and then you'd walk around to the other side and it would always be night. Uh, and so you could imagine this could have some pretty crazy effects on things like the temperature at the surface, the atmospheric wind patterns, all sorts of things. Um, and so, yeah, this phenomenon is called tidal locking. Um, so this planet is tidally locked. And we actually see this in our own solar system. Um, the moon it turns out, um, is tidally locked to Earth. So instead of being locked to the sun, the moon is locked to Earth. So that's why we always see, if you always look in the night sky, every full moon, and you always see the same face facing you. This is the near side of the moon, uh, and you never see the far side of the moon. Humans never saw the far side of the moon um, until the Apollo missions when they flew around the moon. So... Um, I like to conclude um, with just emphasizing that, you know, these planets are really unusual, but they're also um, really, um, they're everywhere. It turns out uh, probably more than 50% of stars um, have planets, and that's like a lower bound. So probably most stars have planets around them. Um, and even if they might be really different than our own solar system, um, it's really exciting to see how... Um, there are planets really everywhere. And that includes um, our nearest neighbor. So our nearest neighbor in space, Proxima Centauri, um, is about four light years away. And uh, it turns out it has a planet. Um, it's called Proxima Centauri b. So I, I should have said this earlier, but the little letters after the, the first thing, the first couple let, w words are the name of the star. Uh, and the little letter designates that it's a planet. Um, and the planets kind of iterate like B, C, D, E if there's more than one. Um, and yeah, so Proxima Centauri b has a planet, has a super Earth. Um, uh, this planet's a little bit uh, colder than Earth, uh, so it might just be frozen. It might not be a very habitable planet, but it's out there. And our near so yeah, our nearest neighbor in space, um, Proxima Centauri, has its own planet. Um, and so that just goes to show how exciting it is to um, 
be in this field and look for these planets and realize that, you know, the, uni the galaxy and the universe has so much to show us and so much for us to learn about all these other planets that we didn't know were out there um, from our solar system perspective. Um, and so with that, um, I'm happy to briefly pause for any questions. Um, and um, uh, after I take any questions, then we can switch to the sky show um, that I'll be presenting with Stellarium. Um, but does anyone have any other questions? You can feel free to put them in the chat. So someone already asked a little bit earlier. Um, if I think they were talking about TOI 700D, if it's tidally locked. Uh, and so yeah, TOI 700D is tidally locked. Um, so the same side of it, um, basically just based on kind of gravitational interactions, if it's star, um, we uh, are pretty sure that the same side of it always faces its star at all times. So as it rotates um, around, as it orbits around its star, the same side of it, it rotates just so that the same side of it always faces the sun. Okay, so with that, um, I do want to switch to the star show tonight. Um, unless anyone has, if anyone has any other questions, you could put them in the chat. And maybe I'll come back to them um, after the star show. Um, uh, but let's switch over to that. Okay. So hopefully now you can see um, what well doesn't look like much at the moment, just a field. Um, uh, and so I should just introduce this program that we're using. You know, usually if we were back in person, then I'd be able to use the uh, um, the planetarium. Uh, so if you haven't been, UCLA has a lovely planetarium um, that's full of uh, it, you sit in a dark room and we have uh, a star projector um, with thousands of stars in it and it's really impressive. So if you're ever on campus, uh, once things open back up, you should definitely uh, try to go because it's very cool. Um, but um, hopefully, you know, in a few months we'll have in-person shows again, but at the moment we're doing everything virtually. And so, um, I'll use this uh, program, it's free online, you can actually download it yourself uh, if you so desire, uh, called Stellarium. Um, and what this program does is it shows us a full picture of the night sky. Uh, and so, you know, I've just placed us kind of in a field here. Um, and uh, in red down here you can see these cardinal directions. Um, so this is, we're facing uh, west right now. Um, and I just want to take you around and show you um, kind of some exciting things that you can see in the night sky. So um, this is kind of what the sky probably looks like above Los Angeles right now. Um, and you can see that you can't really see all that much, you know. Um, you can see uh, a few bright points that we'll come back to. Uh, you can see maybe a couple of other stars scattered about. Um, but you can't see much, and that's because, you know, Los Angeles has a lot of light pollution, and um, uh, so it, it turns out to kind of block a lot of the light, the light reflecting off the atmosphere, um, blocks a lot of the dimmer stars from our view. Um, but, um, you know, if you were to travel out, maybe, you know, out of the LA basin and into, you know, the hills, uh, maybe the Santa Monica Mountains or something, things would start to look a little bit better. Uh, you'd dim the light pollution a little bit. Um, and you'd start to see at least a few stars. 
Um, you can maybe start to make out some constellations from time to time. Um, so now I'm panning up into the sky. Um, it's kind of straight up and you could maybe um, make out this summer triangle. You might be able to just see this um, from the uh, from Los Angeles, but if you go to a slightly darker place, you can make out this. The summer triangle um, is highest in the sky in the summer, so it's starting to set even now as we go into the fall. Um, but it's made up of three very bright stars, Vega, Deneb, and Altair. Um, and you can start to see some interesting things. Um, but um, if you drove out, you know, to a place like Joshua Tree, really far from um, any light pollution, uh, you can start to see some really fantastic things. And so that's what this looks like. You start to be able to make out uh, the Milky Way um, in the west here, in the, the southwest. Um, all sort, you can start to make out all sorts of constellations, all sorts of stars, and we'll talk about kind of all the amazing things that you can see. Um, but first we can talk about the um, kind of the brightest things that you can see. So you can see Venus just above the horizon here in the west. Um, Venus is setting uh, pretty fast right now, um, and that's because, you know, Venus um, is in between the sun and us, so it always has to be kind of in the same direction of the sun. Um, that's why people sometimes call it the evening star, uh, because it's always low in the sun in the evening, or uh, it can be high uh, it can be low in the sky in the morning um, uh, with the rising sun. And so a lot of ancient cultures, um, you know, they identified Venus because it's pretty bright. Um, but uh, some cultures weren't sure if it was the same thing or if it was two separate things. So there's this idea of the morning star and the evening star. And some people figured out that it turns out both of them are the same, that you never see one on the same night as the other. Um, but um, some people kind of thought they were just different uh, beings or different stars altogether. Um, and so, you know, here we are, um, again, in our dark sky. So what you can see, uh, maybe from Joshua Tree, or another way I like to phrase it is, you know, this is kind of, maybe going back in time to what y the uh, what the Tongva people saw, the people native to the Los Angeles basin um, who've cared for um, the land that, I, you know, I'm giving this presentation from um, for, you know, a longer time than we can even conceive of. And so this is a lot more like what they saw from Los Angeles, um, even if we can't see it today. Uh, and so, you know, the Tongva were able to see Venus, and they were also able to pick out Saturn and Jupiter. Um, and so Saturn and Jupiter you can see um, just even with the naked eye, but if you have a nice telescope, you can start to see some pretty spectacular things. Um, and so we're going to zoom in on Saturn. Slowly but surely. And so if you have, you know, even not a terribly strong telescope, you can make out... Um, Saturn's beautiful rings. And so these are kind of the most famous aspect of Saturn. Let's try to lock onto it. Um, and you can see that it's kind of moving through the sky. I'll try to pause it. Um, and you can, if you even have a really good telescope, start to pick out all these bright things surrounding it. So these are the moons of Saturn. Um, and um, people are really interested in some of these moons uh, because they could have really interesting, some of them have very interesting properties. So Enceladus is a good example. Um, uh, Enceladus turns out to be made of mostly ice. Um, and uh, occasionally, um, spacecraft have spotted these um, plumes coming out of it that indicate that there might be liquid water underneath the surface of Enceladus. And so this is another ocean world, kind of like those ocean exoplanets that we talked about earlier. Um, and another one is Titan, um, which you can see has kind of a yellowish glow here. I think that might be hard to see with a telescope. But um, Titan, it turns out, has an atmosphere a lot like Earth's, except it's made 
of methane instead of having a lot of water. Um, and so methane is a gas on Earth, but um, at the cold reaches of the solar system where Titan is, uh, it turns out to be a liquid. And so Titan actually has methane lakes. Um, and we're going to send a mission to Titan. Uh, and it's actually going to have a helicopter, and it's going to fly around um, and look at Titan's surface and try to understand it. All right, so zooming back out, um, we can take a look at the other kind of bright object that you could see really high in the sky right now. Uh, and that was Jupiter. So I'll pan over to Jupiter. Right, you can see that Jupiter is pretty near Deneb. Um, and with Jupiter, you can't quite see uh, rings. Jupiter does have rings, but they're very faint. Um, but what you can often see with a pretty good telescope are um, Jupiter's um, moons. And so um, Jupiter has four really bright moons. These are called the Galilean moons because they were discovered by Galileo when he looked through uh, his telescope. And they were the first things that Galileo realized um, orbit something other than um, the center of the solar system, basically. The, uh, these moons, you could tell, rotate around Jupiter. Um, and because uh, he looked at them every day, and they always changed their position, but always kind of relative to Jupiter. They were always around Jupiter, but they changed their relative positions relative to each other. Um, and so he deduced that they orbit Jupiter, um, and this is the first thing that people realized didn't orbit um, the center of the solar system, which was thought to be the Earth at that time. Um, and of course, you know, he got in a lot of trouble for this. Um, and so, yeah, if you have a, a good telescope, you can actually pick out these moons and maybe see some of the stripes on Jupiter uh, as well. Um, even from Los Angeles, but it'll be even better if you can go somewhere darker. So I'm zooming back out right into um, the cosmos. Um, and so I've paused it right now, but uh, if I were to make it um, playing and I were to speed it up a little bit, you would notice that, um, so now we're going a little faster, and you can see a little, um, you can see satellites passing every once in a while. Uh, you can see that things seem to be slowly rotating. Um, and all this is is that the Earth is, turns out to be spinning. Um, and since the Earth is spinning, it means that um, uh, the whole sky kind of spins above us as we rotate underneath it. Uh, and so you can see all these stars are moving. Uh, and as we look towards the north, um, it seems like maybe things aren't moving as much. I'll try to speed it up to tell it a little bit more. And it actually looks like things might be turning around something. Um, and uh, so what that turns out to be um, is our north star. So the Earth is spinning on its axis. Um, and its axis actually turns out to point directly at a star. Um, the star is Polaris. Um, and um, again, it's just kind of a coincidence that our um, spin axis points at this star. It could point at a different star. And in fact, in a few you know, hundreds of thousands of years, it will point at a different star. Um, but for now, uh, it points at Polaris. And so uh, this is the North Star that mariners, you know, from all over the world have used for a very long time. Um, you know, it's not just the Europeans, the Polynesians used Polaris to navigate as well. Um, and you can start to pick out um, some constellations. Polaris turns out to be the tip of the Little Dipper. Um, and so I can turn on the constellations, and that kind of gives you maybe more of a clue. Um, and so you've probably heard of the Little Dipper, and you've probably heard of its uh, big brother, um, the Big Dipper, which I believe we'll have to advance a little more to get to rise. Maybe not. Um, Yep, 
Yeah. So here is the Big Dipper. It actually started setting. Uh, so I'll go back in time a little bit. Or maybe I'll go forward. Apologies. There we go. So now we're going kind of late into the night, uh, and the Big Dipper is rising. It's more prominent uh, in the winter. Um, and uh, right, so the Big Dipper, the Greeks have always called it Ursa Major, so something related to a bear somehow. A lot of people have kind of had trouble seeing the bear of it, since it seems to have a big tail. Uh, and a lot of other cultures didn't really go with the bear idea. They uh, have seen it more as a wagon. So, uh, you know, Germanic and Mesopotamian traditions always called this more of a wagon. And I think I see that a little bit better. Um, that it looks a little bit more like a wagon than a bear to me. Um, and so, again, we can pan across the sky. Now the moon is starting to rise. Um, let's see. And I want to pan, you know, turning to the other direction, turning to the south and the southwest. Um, we can look at some constellations that are now pretty high in the sky. So these are going to get higher and higher earlier and earlier uh, as kind of the winter goes on. And so you'll be able to get really good views of these in the next few months. Um, and these are some pretty cool, the constellations of Orion uh, and Taurus. Um, and these have some really cool um, uh, things that you can see in them. Um, and so uh, Orion was always thought of as the hunter by the ancient Greeks that we get most of our constellations from, at least in the Western world. Um, but it turns out a lot of people have kind of seen a hunter in this. The, the Tongva people also saw um, uh, some sort of hunter. And they also, you know, the most recognizable thing uh, was this belt, this belt of Orion, um, that um, has always been identified as a really big landmark in the sky. Uh, and so um, the Tongva people saw this belt as a path leading to the afterlife. Um, and so, yeah, it's really easy to see. You can see, um, uh, you know, Orion's belt. Uh, you can identify it by this big red star it has in his right shoulder called Betelgeuse. Um, I do like to point out, right, so a lot of these constellations seem all Greek, but a lot of these names don't seem Greek at all. In fact, you know, names like Alnitak, Alnilam, Rigel, uh, they're actually all Arabic, and that kind of speaks to the fact that, you know, the constellations might have been named by the Greeks, but the people who really started studying these stars in de enough detail to name the stars uh, were actually the Islamic scholars of the Middle Ages, and so we get a lot of our names from them, and they actually preserved a lot of this knowledge. Uh, during the Dark Ages of uh, Europe um, for uh, Europe to rediscover later. Um, and so uh, one thing that's really spectacular to look at in the sky is um, the belt of Orion, or the uh, below the belt of Orion. It's kind of the sword sheath, um, I like to think of it. And this is um, the Orion Nebula. And so what is the Orion Nebula? It's kind of the birth, it's a stellar birthplace, a stellar nursery. Um, let's see if I can turn on the... There we go. Um, and so it's this incredible formation of gas and dust that lights up in all these incredible colors. Um, and it's the birthplace of young stars. So all, most stars, it turns out, seem to be formed in these sorts of stellar nurseries. Um, and um, they turn out to not only be beautiful, but really important to our understanding of planet formation and star formation, how we get all these exoplanets that we see today. Um, and so um, this is, uh, yeah, the Orion Nebula. It's something, yeah, even if it's not so dark, it's probably not 
visible maybe from Los Angeles, but if you get it a little dark, you can see this pretty well. Um, and so, um, so, you know, the sun, you know, was probably born in a stellar nursery a lot like this, but somehow it's not like that anymore. Um, and uh, it turns out, uh, you know, because this, these processes that form stars are still ongoing today, we can actually kind of look at different snapshots that might have been similar to snapshots in how the sun might have looked at different times. Um, and so after stellar nurseries, uh, you can get these sorts of stellar clusters. Um, and there's one actually nearby Orion um, in the constellation Taurus um, called the Pleiades. And so the Pleiades are this formation of a bunch of densely uh, close together stars. Uh, and it turns out that these stars not only um, are close to each other in the sky, um, but uh, they're actually close to each other, you know, in real space. So most stars, you know, if you see one star next to the other, it's probably not actually particularly close. They might just be kind of in the same direction. Um, but these stars are, in fact, close to each other. Um, this is called, you know, like a young stellar cluster. Um, and we think that this is kind of the next stage. So maybe 100 million years after something like the Orion Nebula, uh, the stars are kind of still grouped, but they're starting to get kind of dispersed and flung out. Um, and eventually this will di the Pleiades will dissipate and you'll have kind of isolated stars like the Sun is today. Um, and so the Pleiades have been recognized by all sorts of different ancient cultures. Um, um, the, uh, and pretty much everyone has thought that it was the Pleiades were important. So the Aztecs, you know, based their entire uh, calendar off when the Pleiades rise exactly at dawn. Um, the, um, you know, the traditional Japanese uh, called this cluster the Subaru, um, and that's, you know, the origin of um, the car company name. That's why if you've looked at a Subaru logo, it has uh, six stars. Different people, depending on your vision, kind of disagree if you can see six or seven from the ground if you don't zoom in. Um, but uh, that's the origin of the Subaru logo. Uh, and uh, I like to, you know, again, tell the story of kind of what, you know, people from Los Angeles have, you know, the local opinion. So um, the Tongva also saw six stars here, and they thought of them as six sisters. So uh, in the traditional story, um, uh, the coyote, who in a lot of these Tongva stories are kind of, um, is kind of a trickster, uh, kind of like how a fox would be maybe in traditional, um, like Aesop's fables. Um, and so the coyote deceives the sisters into marrying him, but it, they don't turn out to like him very much. Um, and so they were debating amongst themselves how to transform in order to kind of escape the coyote's clutches. Um, and so, you know, they thought, well, one person suggested maybe they should turn into sticks. Um, but then another person said, well, maybe the coyote will be able to build something with those sticks. Uh, and, you know, they really wanted to stick it to him to spite him. Um, and then someone else suggested, well, maybe water, but then the coyote could drink the water. Uh, and so finally, um, they decided to go into the sky and escape, and they became uh, what we now call the Pleiades. So they became the six sisters in the sky. Um, and, you know, Coyote was, as you might expect, uh, pretty upset about this. Um, and so he tries, you know, to catch them. Um, he always, you know, was in pursuit of these six sisters again that he married at one point. Um, and um, so, you know, the coyote, you know, went into the sky and tried to chase them. Uh, and he, the coyote became, in the Tongva legend, the star Aldebaran. Um, and you can see if I speed this up. Uh, so right here's the Pleiades, here's Aldebaran. Uh, if I speed this up, you can see that as the sky moves, uh, Aldebaran is always chasing the Pleiades, but the Pleiades are always outrunning it. Because uh, as the sky rotates, Aldebaran, the, this star follows the Pleiades around. Um, so the coyote is continually following around the six sisters uh, in the sky. Um, 
And, um, you know, just as a coincidence, right, people kind of, it's a kind of amazing how similar a lot of these stories are. So what does Aldebaran mean? Uh, well, Aldebaran, like a lot of these other star names, is Arabic. Uh, and it means the follower, because the Arabs also notice that Aldebaran always is following the Pleiades around. Uh, and so Aldebaran means the follower in Arabic. And so they saw, you know, even on different sides of the world, these two cultures saw exactly the same thing going on here, which I think is kind of magical. Um, and um, so again, both these stars, Aldebaran is the brightest star in Taurus. Uh, and I can actually turn on these artworks as well for you guys. Um, so, you know, instead of being the red evil coyote, the Greeks saw Aldebaran as the eye of this evil bull, and the bull is fighting uh, with Orion. So Orion's got his club up here, and he's fighting the bull here uh, with his sword at his sheath, and he's using his club to attack the bull. Um, and so, you know, all these cultures have seen all these different stories in the stars. Um, and, you know, now, you know, we like to think that we take a pretty different approach, but we're still kind of seeking these stories. That's the story of all these super-Earths that I was talking about earlier is all about. We're still looking uh, for stories in the stars, and our stories might be a little bit different, but we're still trying to figure out sort of, you know, where we came from, where we're going, um, what the sky can tell us about, you know, our own lives on Earth. Um, and, yeah, I think that's um, pretty much all I have to say. Um, so, I hope that you guys uh, enjoyed uh, the Planetarium show. We have them every week, and, you know, I think for the next month or so, uh, they'll still be online. Um, let's see, I can switch to the... Uh, video. So they should still be online, um, I think, for the next month. But hopefully sometime soon we'll be able to see you all in person. Um, and um, yeah, with that, if there aren't um, any other questions, I encourage you, you know, to go take a look at the sky. Even if you're in, you know, bright Los Angeles, you can still see uh, at least these planets pretty well. Um, and yeah, and stay safe out there, and have a lovely rest of your week. Oh, yeah, you're very welcome. If you're still here. Thank you for coming. <laughs>